Welcome back, General. In a previous video, I gave you an extensive overview of the United States' armed forces, covering its entry into the war against the GLA, military tactics, and arsenal. I also mentioned three of the country's most prominent generals, Malcolm Granger, Alexis Alexander, and Towns. In this video, I'll be going into more detail about each of them. This will include their short biographies and the unique weapons and tactics that each one brought to the USA. One thing that all three generals had in common was that none of them had the Paladin or Crusader tank in their arsenals. We'll first begin with Air Force General Malcolm Ace Granger. Sonic boom, baby! Let's do this thing. Granger was a four-star general in the Air Force, well known for his capabilities in establishing air superiority over the battlefield. According to his short biography, the son of an Iowa crop duster, General Malcolm Granger's flying career began when he borrowed his father's biplane to go to the state fair in Kansas City. As a lieutenant in the first Iraq war, Granger earned his first notices for knocking out four SAM sites in a single afternoon. As he moved up the Air Force ranks, Granger earned a reputation for advancing the role of fighting aircraft in the U.S. military. Even tempered, yet uncompromising, Granger has developed novel techniques in fuel management and resource deployment during air superiority operations. Those techniques have been used with success in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other theaters. His squadrons are known for precision execution and a strong will to complete the mission. Part of Malcolm's biography mentions that he was stationed at Fort Belmont in Houston, Texas. However, the General's map shows him stationed in Northwest Texas, much further away from Houston. The icon actually seems to be close to the town of Lubbock, which was the site of Reese Air Force Base before it was shut down in 1997. Another note is that the map opposing generals would challenge Granger on doesn't look like it's located that part of the state either. Instead, it seems to be located next to the Rocky Mountains, which would put its actual location as either northern New Mexico or southern Colorado. Being the premier U.S. Air Force general, all aircraft in Granger's arsenal were cheaper to construct. This included stealth fighters, which Granger already had as a part of his arsenal, unlike other generals who needed to requisition these planes separately. Nearly all of Granger's aircraft were modified with laser point defense systems. These lasers significantly increased the survivability of his aircraft, as they could destroy multiple incoming anti-air missiles. They could also be used in tandem with countermeasures from the airfield. The only aircraft that didn't utilize these lasers were the Comanche, C-130, A-10, B-52, and Spectre gunship. Speaking of the Spectre, Granger's reputation gave him access to gunship crews who would fly their craft over a designated target for an extended period of time. This allowed the gunship to wreak even more havoc on enemy units and buildings below, though it also increased the Spectre's exposure to AA fire, decreasing its chances of safely exfiltrating the area. While Granger's Comanches didn't have point laser defenses, they could be modified by mechanics and engineers at the airfield to become stealthy, making them invisible to most enemy units and structures, unless they were moving or firing their weapons. Stealth detecting enemy units could see through the Comanches' camouflage. Come on, General. I'll show you the meaning of death from above. Granger had his own upgraded version of the F-22 Raptor, called the King Raptor. We control the skies. The King Raptor was better than the original in almost every way. The plane was faster, cheaper, and carried a total of six missiles, as opposed to the original Raptor's four. Ground crews at the airfield could quickly reload these missiles, giving the King Raptor the ability to conduct follow-up sorties faster. The plane was more than capable of destroying enemy armor and aircraft in a single strike. Hey General, you ever seen a Raptor up close? <laughs> Granger also had a second variant of the CH-47 Chinook in his arsenal, called the Combat Chinook. Let's load up some soldiers! This variant was only available to the general if he had a war factory, where he would order the mechanics and engineers to construct bunkers that could be attached to the sides of the helicopter. The embrasures on the bunker allowed infantry inside the helicopter to effectively fire their weapons at enemy ground forces below. Pathfinders and missile defenders were a particularly lethal combination. The pathfinders would use their sniper rifles to quickly pick off infantry, 
while the missile defenders would easily destroy any ground vehicles, structures, and even aircraft. Will you look at that? U.S. military spending at its best. The point defense laser on the combat should note meant that it could loiter over the enemy without taking any damage for an extended period of time. This ability was limited to damage from anti-air missiles and not bullets, such as those used by the quad cannon or the Gatling cannon. The combat Chinook could still transport vehicles, though they couldn't use the bunkers. The helicopter could carry supplies, but not while infantry or vehicles were loaded inside. Even with the bunker, any rangers in the Chinook could still perform a combat drop. Other unique aspects of Granger, or those one-star generals who served under him, or that they could call in Rank 1 emergency repairs for their vehicles. They also had the ability to call in a carpet bombing run from a fast-moving B-3 bomber. But a strategy center had to be present before being able to call in such support. How are you enjoying the shock and awe, General? Due to his focus on aircraft, vehicles such as the Humvee, Ambulance, and Tomahawk launcher were more expensive for Granger to deploy though he would make use of these vehicles if the situation required them. You forced me to use tanks. I hate using tanks. Instead of Crusader tanks, C-130s would para-drop Humvees onto a captured reinforcement pad. If any general wished to go up against Granger, they would have to engage him at his stronghold in the United States. One key environmental feature of this area was the river, which ran through the southern half of the map. One bridge connects the southern piece of land with the larger northern portion. Overall, the region that encompassed Granger's stronghold could be split into four quadrants. In the southwest quadrant, there was a supply dock with a mostly open field. This area was an ideal spot for an opposing general to set up their base. Just north of the base is an oil derrick next to the river, and to the southeast was another oil derrick. Both could be captured by the opposing general to generate additional funds. East of the base, close to the bridge, were a couple of supply caches that the general could use. In the southeast quadrant, across the bridge, was another supply dock. Just to the north of this dock was a farm, with two capturable oil derricks nearby. In the middle of the map, moving towards the northwest quadrant, is a town. Within this town, close to the river, is another supply dock, one that General Granger would commonly use as a secondary source of income usually protected by ground troops garrisoned in civilian buildings. A cemetery to the northwest of the village has a single UN crate in the middle, which can be acquired by the opposing general. At the base of some mountains in the northwest quadrant are three capturable oil derricks. South of these oil derricks is an orchard, and south of that orchard is yet another supply dock, waiting to be used by either Granger or the opposing general. The northeast quadrant is the location of Granger's stronghold, which is within the snow-covered mountains. His stronghold features five airfields supported by large hangars. These hangars house additional aircraft within the mountains themselves. There are only two paths up to the stronghold, both of which are protected by Patriot missile systems and patrolling aircraft. True to his doctrine, Granger would assault the opposing general exclusively with aircraft. Watch the skies, General. We're gonna put on an air show. For the opposing general, targeting Granger's airfields was the soundest tactic, though Granger would grow angrier with each airfield that was destroyed. You'll regret destroying that airfield, General. That's two of my airfields you've hit, General. I'm starting to get annoyed. Curse you, General. If you hit another airfield, I'll come for you personally. That's the last airfield you destroy today. Forces, target their command center. Granger would even call for reinforcements from the Navy's aircraft carrier, the USS Olympia. This is General Granger to aircraft carrier Olympia. Send reinforcements. Repeat, send reinforcements. Granger generally didn't have much to say about super weapons or commandos that his opponent might build or recruit. The exceptions were the Scud Storm and Colonel Burton. So, you build a Scud Storm. Think you can defend it? Welcome to the party, Colonel Burton. You're in for it now, General. If the opposing general managed to defeat Granger, they would have to go up against the USA's second prominent general. I guess it's time for me to go find a good airline job. This was, of course, General Alexis Alexander. 
Oh, you're still here, General. I'm impressed by your determination. Let's dance. Alexander was a four-star general of the United States Marine Corps, most known for specializing in super weapons and other defensive capabilities. A logistics staffer during the Second Korean War, Alexander attracted the notice of her superiors with her ability to acquire just about anything. Alexander parlayed that ability into a scholarship and a long and distinguished career in the Marines. To protect supply lines during the first GLA conflict, Alexander developed a tiered scheme of defenses that did not allow a single strike on any of her supply columns. While hardly efficient in her use of resources, General Alexander makes defense and resource acquisition priorities in the early phases of conflict. The General's army takes to the offensive only when she has superior offensive firepower that cannot be touched by counterattack. Fools rush in, General. I take my time. To support her emphasis on defense, Alexander used a modified version of the Patriot missile turret called the EMP Patriot System. In addition to its wider base platform, this system launched missiles that generated electromagnetic shockwaves on impact with their targets. This shockwave shut down any vehicles caught within its radius, practically halting an attack by advancing armor. The system was incredibly deadly against aircraft, as a direct hit by one of its missiles would bring an airplane or helicopter crashing to the ground. Stay out of the air, General. You'll be safer on the ground. Alexander's expertise in superweapons enabled her to construct a particle beam cannon at only half the cost. In addition, the beam of Alexander's particle cannons had a distinct pink glow. I'd attack if I were you, General. If you wait, then I'll just have one more superweapon to fire at you. While EMP Patriot missiles and cheaper particle cannons were a definite benefit in one's arsenal, they required a lot of power to operate. That's why Alexander came up with advanced control rods for her cold fusion reactors, giving them an even greater boost in power generation compared to the standard rods. This boost was noticeable thanks to the light blue glow of the advanced control rods. Besides base structures, Alexander did have one powerful offensive aircraft in her arsenal, this was a special variant of the Aurora Bomber, known as the Aurora Alpha. All units, attack pattern Alpha! <laughs> Just kidding! Who would call something Alpha? Unlike the standard plane, the Aurora Alpha was painted black, and could outpace any and all anti-air weapons, both missiles and bullets, on the flight towards its target. Like the standard Aurora though, the Alpha Bomber was unable to maintain its supersonic speed on the return flight making it vulnerable to all AA weapon systems. Once the Aurora Alpha reached its target, it would drop a fuel air bomb right on top of it. This thermobaric bomb created a powerful explosion that could level most buildings, wipe out clustered units, and send infantry flying through the air. Combined with its supersonic speeds, the Aurora Alpha was all but guaranteed to make a successful attack upon the designated target. Another perfectly executed strike. Just like General Granger, Alexander also had access to enhanced Spectre gunship support, letting the plane bombard a target for an extended period of time. In addition, leaflet drops from a B-52 bomber could be called in earlier, either by Alexander herself or by those three-star generals under her command. Similar to the particle beam cannon, she could have Colonel Burton deployed to the battlefield at a reduced cost. With the exception of the microwave tank, all vehicles in Alexander's arsenal, both ground and air, were more expensive to construct and deploy. If Alexander captured a reinforcement pad, she would have Tomahawk missile launchers periodically paradropped on it. According to her biography, Alexis Alexander was stationed at Fort Freeman in Belfast, Maine. However, her stronghold doesn't appear to be located there. Instead, the environment is similar to that of the archipelago in the Aegean Sea with a few ancient ruins scattered throughout the islands. The US did maintain a fleet and base on the island of Crete during the Zero Hour Conflict, so it would make sense that Alexander had a stronghold located in this region. Scattered throughout the small islands in this area are EMP Patriot systems, creating a solid defense against any enemy aircraft attempting to assault Alexander's primary base. I've been analyzing your tactics, and I'm just amazed. Do you even have any tactics, General? The region encompassing Alexander's stronghold can be split into four quadrants. 
In the southwest is an island with mostly flat land, and a nearby supply dock for an opposing general to construct their base. Just west of this supply dock are two oil derricks and a UN crate, which can be captured to generate additional funds. To the north are a couple of small islands, with a neutral oil derrick located on one of them. In the southeast quadrant is an artillery platform owned by Alexander. This platform guards a few nearby supply caches. The platform could either be destroyed or captured by the opposing general. East of this platform is a neutral oil derrick guarded by an EMP Patriot. South of that derrick is one of Alexander's particle beam cannons, which is protected by a couple of defensive structures. Just like with the artillery platform, the opposing general would need to either capture or destroy this weapon before it was used against them. In the northwest quadrant was a second large island that had a supply depot and supply center that Alexander used to generate funds to support her stronghold. On the island's northwestern beach, there are two UN crates holding additional funds. In the northeast quadrant is Alexander's island base. Many of her buildings were located between some mountains, with her two other particle beam cannons and extra power plants taking up the high ground. Alexander wouldn't be intimidated by the opposing general's construction of super weapons like the Scud Storm or nuclear missile silo. Do you think I'm scared of your little Scud Storm? That nuke silo doesn't frighten me. While she would respect the general for building a particle beam cannon, Alexander would insist that she was the only one who was actually allowed to construct one. I appreciate your choice in weaponry, but I'm the only one allowed to have a particle cannon on this battlefield. Alexander was quite dismissive of Commando's Colonel Burton and Black Lotus. Colonel Burton? Really? Do you think he's going to help you? Black Lotus? Well, I guess it's just a girl power showdown, isn't it? Jarman Kell, on the other hand, disgusted her. Jarman Kell, he better stay away from my tanks. Assaulting Alexander's base could be tricky, as she had plenty of EMP Patriots and artillery platforms defending it. Infiltration maneuvers could distract her attention, or be a way to actually destroy her superweapons. I don't appreciate unexpected visitors, General. Otherwise, the opposing general would have to use their own. You have no respect for other people's property. After defeating Alexander, the opposing general would have to go up against the USA's third prominent general. Oh, it's not fair. One more superweapon and I would have beaten you, General. Challenge me again. I dare you. The final one was General Pinpoint Towns. Prepare yourself, General. You're about to be taught a lesson in war. General Towns was a four-star general of the U.S. Army. Stationed at Fort Union in Redwood Shores, California, Towns was well known for his promotion and use of laser weaponry. An early champion of laser technology in the USA Armed Forces, Pinpoint Towns developed comprehensive offensive and defensive strategies around laser-based weapons. Towns received an appointment to the U.S. Army War College in 2008 to teach his theories. However, Towns found academic life too slow, and returned to a battlefield command in 2010. Relying on inexpensive, powerful laser technology throughout his forces, and his unique knowledge of its strengths and weaknesses, General Towns has consistently received superior marks during war games and live fire actions. This four-star general continues to push the technology envelope in harnessing energy and improving power efficiency, and the army is counting heavily on him. It's a whole new age of warfare, General, and it's coming to your doorstep. Similar to General Alexander, Towns had his own unique defensive system called the Laser Defense Turret. As its name implies, this platform was mounted with a laser gun that could cut down any ground units or aircraft. This weapon was cheaper to construct and more powerful compared to the standard Patriot missile turret. Unlike the missiles on the Patriot system, the laser on the defense turret could not be evaded or intercepted, guaranteeing a hit on the target. The downside to this turret was that it required more power to operate compared to the Patriot missile system. To offset these power demands, Towns' cold fusion reactors were designed to generate additional power for his base, both with and without control rods. Dozers, build more reactors. Lasers take a lot of power. Another unique weapon system in Towns' arsenal was the Laser Tank, or Laser Crusader as it's sometimes called. 
Laser Crusader ready for engagement. This tank utilized the Crusader's chassis, but was armed with a laser, which could melt through enemy armored vehicles and structures with ease. The only other tank that could match up with the laser tank was the Overlord, which was still more expensive and slower than Towns' tanks. Can you match 50 million megajoules of lazing power, General? Like the standard Crusader, laser tanks were quite vulnerable to aircraft. Therefore, they had to be supported by Avengers, which towns could produce and deploy at a cheaper cost. The greatest weakness of the laser tank was its power cost, which it needed to function. So if General Towns didn't have enough power, all his laser tanks and defense turrets would be shut down. No! Stay away! I need those reactors to power my lasers! Because he had complete confidence in his laser weapons, Towns didn't have any Tomahawk missile launchers in his arsenal. If he managed to capture a reinforcement pad, C-130s would periodically paradrop laser tanks onto it. Unlike the previous two generals, an opponent would face off against Towns at his stronghold in Redwood Shores. The stronghold itself was located right in the middle of the city, and was designed like a star fort. Your weapons can't match my pinpoint accuracy, General. Why not just surrender? Just like the other stronghold maps, I'll be splitting this one up into four quadrants, with a focus on the areas just outside Towns' fort. In the southwest quadrant is a region of flat land for an opposing general to construct their base. Next to this area, right across a couple of train tracks, is a supply dock for the general to use. Just slightly to the north of the base is an oil derrick, which can be used to provide additional funds. Further northeast of the base were three artillery platforms, which the general could capture to help protect their base from Towns' ground assaults. There is also a repair bay the general could capture to obtain active repairs for his vehicles. Many buildings are located in this quadrant just in front of the opposing general's base, and Towns utilizes plenty of infantry to garrison these buildings and other structures throughout the city. My planning and preparation is leading me to a clear victory! The city extends further into the southeast quadrant, with a lake nestled in the corner. Just north of this lake is another capturable artillery platform, overlooking an additional supply dock. In the northeast quadrant is a canal with four bridges, two of which lead into Towns' stronghold. More importantly though, there is an oil refinery and three oil derricks that can be captured and utilized by the opposing general. Finally, in the northwest quadrant is a hospital, which could provide medical aid to wounded infantry on the battlefield. North of this hospital is another supply dock. Just slightly east of this dock is a reinforcement pad, albeit one that is practically next to Towns' stronghold. With the exception of sending infantry and vehicles to assault the opposing general's base, Towns was largely content on having his opponent come to him, knowing that his laser defenses could repel any attack, either on the ground or in the air. That's quite a lot of planes, General! Are you putting on an air show? <laughs> Towns was more reliant on his particle beam cannons to destroy his opponent's base. Would you like me to beam you up, General? <laughs> Towns wasn't intimidated by super weapons like the Scud Storm or nuclear missile silo. Sell that Scud Storm, General, or I'll destroy it for you. That nuke silo won't stop me, General. He was quite amused at the sight of an opponent's particle cannon, though. If you build a particle cannon and I destroy it with a particle beam, is that irony? Towns was dismissive of any commandos that the opposing general might recruit against him. General, Colonel Burton is a bumbling fool. Black Lotus is not invisible to my lasers, General. I hope Jarman Kell isn't using a laser scope on his rifle. It wouldn't work against me. The primary weakness of Towns' stronghold was that he couldn't have all his laser defense turrets online at the same time, as he didn't have enough power for them. This meant that the opposing general would have to conduct attacks from multiple directions in order to break into the stronghold. How can you be winning? This isn't how it played out in the simulation! Targeting Towns' reactors ensured that he couldn't bring any more of his defenses online, or utilize his laser tanks and particle beam cannons, eventually bringing about his defeat. You defeated me, General, 
that I will scan your tactics and devise a superior strategy. These three prominent generals didn't seem to play a major role during the Zero Hour conflict, which may have been a miscalculation on the part of the US. As Malcolm Granger's formidable Air Force, combined with Alexis Alexander's superweapons and General Towns' advanced lasers, could have resulted in a more favorable outcome for the country in its fight to rid the world of the GLA.